Oh, hey, uh, are, are you ready for this uh, this Sunday? Yeah. Oh, let me tell you something. I have catering covered. We got snacks. Seating has been arranged. Seating? I have, okay. even have D, uh, music. We got a we got a DJ. Um, music and well, it's a raucous affair. You gotta have music for this sort of thing. Come on. Oh, sounds like this could be big. Yeah. Oh no 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 no! Not even six players. We won't even need a caller. Trust me. Okay. You okay. will not. You have not seen a more engaged player than you do right now. Trust me. It, it sounds like you've taken care of everything. <laughs> I have. Because this is player engagement on WebDM. This episode is sponsored by Dungeon Fog, the online map maker and authoring tool for game masters. Save yourself hours of time, generate awesome maps of buildings, rooms, dungeons, and more with GM notes and share, print, or export them with just a few clicks. They just got a big new update with duplicating and rotating rooms and levels and dynamic lighting that passes through windows and doors, people. There's free on-demand and subscription access options, so go make a map today. Up your game in 2021 with dungeon fog link in the comments and description uh so jim we've talked about like pretty much from the dm side like how to how to engage your players but some of the onus is on the players themselves certainly so yeah. so yeah let's flip that coin over and uh let's look at it from the player side um, I know uh, we, we have discussed uh, recently uh, in the last few years of our gaming uh, how certain games have kind of changed uh, how how we how the, the players driving the action as opposed to waiting for the hooks to latch on to. Yes. I know Invisible yeah. Sun's a big one. Cypher has mm -hmm. arcs, things like that. Like games that have like arc systems. So like, just speak on that. Like on 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 what it means for a player to actually drive the game forward. Yeah, so for me, it is it's best encompassed by uh, the mindset of being proactive, like from mm -hmm. a player perspective before you've even made a character, understanding that like nothing happens in this game until a player decides for it to happen. And if that's not the case, then you're either in a railroad, which is a bad type of linear adventure, right? It's It's, it's a linear adventure gone wrong. Um, or you're just sort of in some kind of weird performance art type situation or psych experiment. I don't know what to call it, but it's like if you're not actually making decisions, then you're not playing the game. And so with that understanding, the first decision I make is what do I want to do when I sit down and it's time to play and it's time for something to happen? Do I have an agenda? Do I have a, a, a goal in mind for what I want to do? So even if the DM doesn't necessarily know what they want to do, even if they've, they've prepared something, but they're open to other possibilities, like I've come ready to do something. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, you know, for me, that's very important is to have something I want out of this particular session or this particular uh, game or whatever. And it doesn't always have to be the same. Sometimes it's it's like determining where we're going to spend the next few sessions and, and just really driving the game forward. Other times it's like, how are we going to approach the situation? Um, but I've, I usually almost always come with something. And if I don't, then that that's, you know, I don't beat myself up over it. But there are some times where just, I got nothing. Um, mm -hmm. But for the most part, I, I prefer to engage this level. And... From a DM's perspective, this can be very refreshing because when a player approaches you and is like, I, I want to do this thing, then they've basically handed you on a silver platter something that they're going to be super engaged with and and yeah. to uh, you know to respect that and to like, okay, I'm going to take this and make some something out of it. Um, yeah. But from a player side, DM can't does that, can't do that, can't does that, geez. <laughs> DM can't do that. <laughs> A DM can't do something with what you've handed them if you don't tell them this is what I want to do. Um, mm -hmm. All of that seems self-evident, but the number of times I've encountered players who don't seem to know what they want out of a game is significant. And mm -hmm. I, I think that if you're looking to be to be engaged, 
then you have to be willing to invest something in the game. You have to be willing to think about it outside uh, of the sessions and at the very least show up to the session with a goal in mind and, and be ready to say like, yeah, I'm, I'm taking the lead. I'm, I'm deciding what we do next uh, mm -hmm. as, as a way to like really drive the game. Oh yeah, and that like like we were talking about earlier with uh, we're talking about communication that that goes both ways. Like what you're talking about here, because uh, I, I know sometimes players can feel like maybe they've had a, a a GM in the past who had a very clear idea of what they wanted their campaign to be and didn't need any outside influence from the players, and so they might be more uh, hesitant to mm. put forth like, hey, I really kind of want to do this thing because they might think that they're stepping on the campaign's toes, so to speak. Sure. Right? Sure. When it's like, no, no, you can't step on your own. I mean, you can't step on your own toes. That's that's a <laughs> dumb way to say that. But you're part of the campaign. So therefore, you as a player should help drive the campaign forward. Right? Yeah, yeah, I, I do think so. And, and you know, what you're saying there in the in that first part of like, there, there are players who are so used to having their choices, like, not matter at all or what they want to do not matter at all, that they do take on a very passive and almost lethargic role when playing. And it isn't until mm -hmm. something concrete like combat, which is tactile, lots of dice, lots of things going on, fast pace, that kind of thing, then they're otherwise checked out. And and mm -hmm. that eventually creates its a play style in and of itself. But if you're trying to like start an open world game where they have a lot of agency and a lot of choice without like helping them get to that different mindset of different play style so you can have a disaster right you're, yeah. you're going to have a bunch of players who mill about and do nothing because they don't know what to do they don't see what it is or they're worried that you only want them to do one thing and mm -hmm. and because it's hidden they're worried about doing the wrong thing and right. from a player side like understanding and trusting that it, there isn't a wrong thing, and if there is, it's not going to be a disaster, is mm -hmm. is a, an important part of that. Important part of putting out goals and 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 taking that step forward to drive the game. Not every player wants right. to do this, but I don't know that I've ever been in a group where there wasn't at least one person who was like chomping at the bit to play and like getting people going. Like, okay, we're going to do this. You want to do that? Like, they're usually the ones. <laughs> they're usually the ones to like get other players motivated and moving and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. But I think as we're talking about this, it's important to note that this is all within the context of the group as a whole. It's not like there's a bully player that comes in and browbeats everyone to do what they want, including the DM. That's bad play. But someone that yeah. helps others in, come on, like, hey, let's do this. This sounds fun. To get, this sounds fun. We should do this together, right? <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, definitely, definitely, and uh, and 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 knowing um, the players knowing their own motivations, and and the thing is, is a player can have different motivations for a session than their character. Those can be two different things, but all achieving the same end. And mm -hmm. knowing the difference between those two uh, is important for players, I think, because um, it also because you might be able to rope. A, rope other players in by offering them like out of character motivations like at th us at the table hey let's have a good time and try to save the princess today in character it's more about all right now you're going to distract those guards while we do this and like you actually get down to the brass tacks of it but, but yeah getting people hyped for the game there's multiple levels to do that and so mm -hmm. therefore you have a you have a chance for a certain player to give their you know friday night lights all all heart clear eyes speech <laughs> or whatever and the, right. the dm doesn't have to keep doing that to keep the game going you know <laughs> keep the game going yeah yeah so uh, playing a, a, a someone who's there to be supportive of the other players and mm -hmm. and sort of generally go along with what they want to do is a valid and and empowering play style right it can really lift a group up and you know w one of the things to me that that kills my engagement as a dm and some a lot of times as a player is dithering just a lot of oh yeah just a lot of spinning our wheels and like i really love it when there's a player at the table who's like yes that that's the one like we're doing this let's do it right guys let's go i think a lot of times players take a i don't know they kind of mirror their character's role in that sense 
right? Like if your character hangs back and doesn't do a lot, is involved in a lot of like, you know, social scenes or doesn't do much in combat, you don't really get super into it. Then you might just like not be as forward and, and Mm -hmm. uh, sort of like driving the action because your character isn't, but I don't think that that needs to be the case. You know, I, I don't think that you need to step back because your character wouldn't do this. Right, like it's it's right. possible to go like, well, as a player, I'm ready to get this moving, you know, mm-hmm. uh, or I'm ready for us to make this decision. Oh, most definitely. Um, and so uh, these are all these are all good practices, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so, but there are, there are some other some other little tidbits that we can get to. Tidbits. Uh, little sorry, tidbits. A little throwback. Um, what I think one of the things um, is it, it, players need to remember. To share the spotlight, like yeah. not just the DM flashing it around, like players need to realize whenever, okay, I've been heading this up for a while now. Hey, what do you think, cleric? And just like literally passing the baton, you know, mm. or whatever, however you want it, whatever analogy lets you see that, but passing it along <laughs> to other players, you know, because you got to rope them in. And you gotta let them let them take it, you know. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. You gotta rope them in, bring in other players. You know, what is it that they, as players, like doing? What is it that that you know that they like about this particular game, this particular character they're playing, and and finding opportunities to like, hey, why don't you? This could be an opportunity for you to step in, or if you mm-hmm. want to do this, I will support you. Right, my character has your back. That kind of thing. Um, but it's also knowing when to like, like you were saying, throw the spotlight to someone else to, to be like, Hey, in that one session, you mentioned your character was into this thing we're investigating or knew a piece of lore that might be relevant here. And sort of like bringing that back up, uh, remembering something out of their character's backstory that might be relevant for that situation so that you as a, another character (laughs) can reference that other character's backstory starts reinforcing the reality of it and it no longer exists as this isolated thing for that one player it is a fact of the world we can all reference it you know yeah and and in that sense you can boost and and augment each other's you know like creative expression through your characters by like getting into the other (laughs) players characters like finding a reason to like them and what is it that they do that you think's interesting is it something your character would find interesting or is it just something you as a player think is interesting and want to see more of right like Mm -hmm. those are ways to just like foster interaction then the more interaction there is the easier it is to interact with other things the easier it is for the gm to find something you'd be willing to interact with and just start getting things moving oh most definitely um and it, it, in in the thought of getting things moving, uh, the when, one way you do that is by acting. Uh, you have to act, but yeah. you also have to be clear in what you're doing. Like mm-hmm. as a player, you can think, "Oh, I'm going to put, a, I'm going to hoodwink these bad guys," and not tell the full intent of what you're doing. But you need to, out of character, be like, "All right, this is what I'm trying to do with this. I'm trying to dupe these guards." That's why I'm acting like I'm falling off the ba- in battlements right now or whatever. You know? Right. Like, yeah. Like everybody has to know what you're trying before you just say, I'm going to do this thing. And everybody goes, that's insane. That's you know? insane. Yeah. Yeah. And yet it happens more than you might realize, right? Of, of, of a player just saying like, I'm going to do this thing. And as a DM, you're like, I don't know what you're trying to accomplish with that. So <laughs> yeah. I can't tell you if you succeeded or failed. <laughs> you yeah. <know>? Like, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, this is something that, that does require you to like drop in and out of, of, you know, the full character immersive experience where you're, you know, being your character, but it's worthwhile sometimes to just go, yeah, this is what I want to do with this moment. This is why I'm doing this. This is, this is Uh what I hope to accomplish, or this is the kind of message I'm trying to convey with this next bit of in character dialogue, you know? Right. Um, and being able to just quickly state that and, and, and just have that be information for the DM to use to you know, information for the DM to use to help them resolve the action. And then you move on to, you know, describing it in 
you know, whatever terms you want, right? Like you can go all in yeah. character. You can get real descriptive. You can just say like, okay, well, I hop on this. And I, I do the thing, roll dice, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but stating intent with actions is uh, best, pr best practice. Yeah, best play practice. Yeah. You know, you know, I have to wonder if, if Leroy Jenkins had just told <laughs> that group and that guild his intent, <laughs> Before just charging into that dungeon, if things might have turned out different for that whole, <laughs> I swear it's a staged video, right? I don't. I don't, I don't know. It's still just it's one a of good my example. favorite things to it's, watch. It just, it, yeah, it doesn't stop being just, a good example. Yeah, it will always be. It is the Leroy Jenkins of examples. Oh um, man! But um, but but here's the thing. Players can do many things to drive action forward, but, you know, there are times when sometimes you have to, like, you just have to bite the hook. Like, it's sitting right there. You as players, especially players that have played for a long time, I know that, I know for me, sometimes mm -hmm. you're, you're doing a one-shot, right? Like, or it doesn't matter what it, like, but a one-shot is a prime example, I think, for this. If you're doing mm -hmm. a one-shot, there's a thing that you're supposed to do. Right. Yeah. And when the hook is just dangling there, to me, it is not a good thing to go, well, what's over here? You know, sure. let's just leave that dangling. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I, so I, sometimes you just got to swallow your pride and bite the hook. You know, I don't sometimes, know. Sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes. Listen, every DM has their limits. Every every DM has a point at which they're like, I'm not ready. I, you yeah. know, I'm, I just I'm, or I don't want to, you know, and. And accepting that, like, what comes with agency and being able to pick pick the course of action that your that your uh, character takes, the goals for the game, whether it's session to session or campaign, like, for the DM to to do as much as they can to step back, and the player mm -hmm. to be like, well, like I'm in the driver's seat. This campaign goes where I want it to go, dice, you know, notwithstanding. At some point, you're going to get to you know the dm's just gonna be like it's this or nothing <laughs> you know and and i think this applies for one shots like you're saying where you're, you've just got a few hours to play and and you want to avoid dithering and why would i do that and motivation and just be like yep i'm here let's do it we can even jump straight to the action um yeah or it's like a long-term campaign where the dm's constantly trying to introduce things for your characters to do and follow up on like being on the lookout for hooks that for one it seems like the dm's really interested in right like one of the things about engagement we haven't sort of mentioned yet is how infectious it can be and how reciprocal it can be in terms of like the dm's invested and engaged there's a player that's invested and engaged they're able to get another one in and then another and, mm -hmm. and if there's anyone out it's their own choice and like really get things moving you know, and so being able to identify like what hook does the DM seem really excited about? Like, yeah. what is it that they seem eager to do? Does that sound worthwhile? Should you know? Could we follow up with that and have a good time? Um, I I don't think that means you're obligated to. I think that if the the choice you would rather make is do something else, then that just might not be a game for you to play right now. Right? It might be better to say, you know what? I'm less interested in this thing. I feel like I'd rather do something else. I'm going to step out of this one, you know, and, and, you know, especially if it's like the thing that the DM has on offer is really something you don't want to do rather mm -hmm. than derail things, rather than, you know, make other players lives miserable, just walk away, you know, just bow out <laughs> of that one. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, otherwise, like at some point as a player, it's not unreasonable to expect that you will accept what the dungeon master or whoever has provided and roll with it. If it's not enough, then let them know. But, you know, they have, they have limits. I don't know what else to say about it. It's like they have limits. <laughs> well, I was going to, I was going to say, if, I mean, if DMs are doing everything that we've already talked about, if they're listening right. to their players and, and working their backstories in and fostering trust and communicating very well, like, now it's on the onus. It's the players who have to trust the DM that when they put a hook out there, if they haven't disappointed you before, then grab it. You know, you're, hey, mm. there's a whole new line of adventure, and the DM's obviously prepared for it. So 
maybe this will be a fun adventure. I don't know, but you don't know until you get uh, get yanked yeah. down the down the path. Oh, certainly. If, if you know, if I have a player who's like, this is what I want to do. This is what I'm into. This is what my backstory is. Here's where I'm at. And then I went ahead and planned like a whole big adventure with them in mind. And then they seemed to not care. Then I'd be like, I don't really want to play with you anymore. And this might be the straw that breaks the camel's back. Not that I'm speaking from experience or anything. Right. Uh, but if that were to happen to me, uh, that's how I would react. <laughs> yeah. <Right? laughs> it's understandable. <laughs> right. Because it's it sucks as a DM to be like, oh, I thought I was creating this thing that you would want to do like these are the signals mm -hmm. clear and loud i've been getting about what right. you want to do and when presented with it i got nothing i got you yeah. know like it wasn't even that i got a i hate this why did you do this it just like seemed like you were uninterested and that's yeah. what it like that's you get one of those right <laughs> you get one mm -hmm. of those and after that now as dm you just be like no i'm not going to do that work for you you know yeah <laughs> just well, <not>. I mean, <laughs> engagement and agency goes both ways man yes yeah yeah being able to recognize mm -hmm. that it is is it is mutual and at some point it is okay to say i expect this of you as a player in this game i expect you to pay attention as a mm -hmm. as my dm i expect you to listen to me and and to to let me impact the game like there's nothing mm -hmm. wrong with saying this is my bottom line this is what it it takes to get me to play and if that's not met then you just feel like yep i'm not gonna play you know um yeah. or if it's someone that won't abide by those uh boundaries and respect them as they claimed to then it's time to say you don't get to play with us anymore you know yeah. this is this is outside the bounds of what we expect from play etiquette and, and how we treat mm -hmm. each other. So it's possible yeah. to go over the line, but, um, you know, that's a different topic altogether. <laughs> yeah. They can, they can just Leo Leroy Jenkins right out of the campaign. <laughs> you just go and everybody else can have a, a good time, you know? Uh, and, and it, you know what, that might need to happen. Even if there is, even if there's otherwise not a problem, because it might just be you have too many people at the table mm -hmm. and, it's time to split up to, to, to have some different play time together or something. Yeah. Uh, Adult Swim did tell us that too many cooks can spoil the broth. So Certainly it can. <laughs> it can. <laughs> Thank you. Too many cooks. Too many cooks. Let's read a patron question. In case y'all didn't know, we've got a whole community over on Patreon with lots of different rewards. We've got a whole other podcast. There's a level with a hangout, discounts, and all kinds of stuff. And we read a question from one of our patrons every week here on the podcast. So here we go. So we have a Patreon question here, Jim. Uh, let's, go, let's get our warm up on. Uh, recently, yeah. I've been stuck on the question, um, assuming that all the monsters in the monster manual exist in enough abundance to have reliable documentation of them. How the hell have civilized humanoids, uh, humans, elves, etc., become the dominant species in the world? I would love to hear your thoughts from a world-building perspective on how that's the case, as well as any ideas on what the opposite world would the opposite would look like, where the monsters are the dominant species in the world. Man, well, I mean that's a that's a that's a dense one, but it's I mean a big chunk of juicy world-building. It, it is a big chunk of juicy world building. I, I have a I have a metagame wet blanket to throw on part of this question, and I'll, okay. I'll just go ahead and do that. To me, the monster manual, like saying that there's enough that they uh, exist in enough abundance to have documentation on them. Yeah, but that's like a metagame thing. Like the 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 DM mm. needs to know what these, even if there's only one of them. You still got to know sure. about it, yeah, yeah. so that's not like it's not like Volos, where it's from an in-world perspective on these monsters. So, mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. that's my that's my metagame wet blanket to throw on that. Now, having said that, though, I do like the idea that you have all this all this life out there, yet humanoids are the dominant species, and I will only point to our own Earth, where there are millions of animals out there in much more abundance than us. 
yet humans are the quote unquote dominant species because uh, sure, we have sure. technology and guns and stuff. Yeah, but, yeah. I mean, it, it's weird. It's like there are other intelligent creatures outside of humanoids oh, yeah. in the D and D world, including like giants, which are like by definition just giant humanoids you right. know uh, <laughs> right so anything that applies to like elves or humans or whatever you could also say about like fire giants and ice or frost giants or whatever you know um mm -hmm. so yeah I, i'm with you there assuming like that first the first part though assuming that all monsters in the monster manual exist in enough abundance to have reliable documentation on them at a place like the forgotten realms sure there's people like volos and others but but not even that i imagine most D, &D settings have some kind of in-world bestiary and as an yeah. aside like actual medieval bestiaries are some of the most awesome monster idea uh books you can get your hands on they're really cool um and uh and so i imagine there's something the equivalent of in a D and D world, whether that's reliable information, mm -hmm. is 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 another matter entirely. Um, but I I I take the question to be <clears throat> like just assuming there are a, a, an abundance of monsters, which I believe most D and D worlds that would qualify. There's a lot of them, right? Yeah. How how in the hell have civil humans uh, civilized humanoids become the dominant species of the world? I think what you're getting at, Pruitt, is like the tool use, the organization. Uh, yeah, you yeah. know, just the the capacity to to act as something greater than than you know the individual uh, parts. Like that's that certainly explains sort of the baseline of it. You know, like mm -hmm. you would say that most of these most of these D and D worlds, there's some kind of dominant civilization. Yeah, you know, that most of the map is accounted for. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, and the fact that you know humans can catalog what these animals and monsters can do mm -hmm. so therefore you have ways to fight them what they're scared of i mean like i agree you would probably i mean you would have sages in these worlds or biologists entomologists like people who study the wildlife rangers druids mm -hmm. things like naturalists. that and naturalists like yeah, that, yeah. And, and they would pass around like oh well these are afraid of fire these are afraid of light these only attack at night like you know yeah. these can't climb well thus let's build walls like it's just i mean i don't know it's like uh, like i will say this yeah. in my starward bound world uh my spelljammer campaign setting humans were not the dominant species until they were freed by the elves and dwarves because humans were just like slaves for the illithids they were like created as a slave race for the illithids and the uh, uh and so you know you can have it any way you want like they don't have to be i think the opposite of that would be like um a study in you know what would it like to be the minority species like what if dragon like i mean well the dragonborn are still kind of humanoid um mm -hmm, mm -hmm. hmm i mean you'd have to go with like illithids or like neogi things like that i mean like these are the races that that do this kind of thing uh sure, imagining them sure. on top uh it's not very good for the elves and humans like no no it isn't and and like I, I, most at some point in a lot like the main D, &D worlds right thinking of like uh, forgotten realms and or eberron you know Mm -hmm. This was the case at one point. The monsters did used to rule this place, right? Like, mm -hmm. there used to be a time when it was dragons that that called the shots, or one of the giant uh, civilizations. So, I, really, I believe Eberron literally has like an age of monsters or something like that in its sort of deep history. Uh, but I'm not really up to snuff on Eberron's lore. Um, mm -hmm. But it certainly has like nations of monsters. There's that whole country where it's like hags, you know, a, a triarchy of hags uh, or triumvirate of hags uh, rules everything. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think this is usually present and it's not good for the <laughs> humans and dwarves and elves and, you know, and, and even then compare compare them each other. Why is it that humans are the dominant civilization when there are elves? Right, like when they're when they're people that that can survive for as long as they can, that have this sort of mm -hmm. institutional and and civilizational memory, how it ever could have reached a point where where humans uh, become the dominant civilization, and yet there are sufficient number of elves around for them to participate in that, you mm -hmm. know, that they didn't just wipe themselves out, kind of thing, you know. 
Yeah, I think that has to do with uh, prodigious birth rates of humans versus uh, shorter. <laughs> That's always what rates. they say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just well, you know, it gets very. It gets very. I I find all of this rather like. Why are the humanoid species dominant? Like, I take a very game first perspective on it. Like, they are because that provides the largest pool for player options, right? And mm-hmm. and it's it's fun to have this all of these different peoples sharing a same place and and sort of getting along or in conflict with each other it provides a lot of options for those kinds of things. It does stretch the limits of plausibility, and so that's usually why I'll say something like this this situation of, of humanoid species being dominant is is a very recent thing right in a historical sense it might be like that this is the second generation of elves that have been that are used to this situation and before that it was a time of monsters like there was no there was no peace or space for for us to settle down and begin to cultivate and to whatever you know um it, in it could be that this isn't like a, a succession of civilizations but it, that it happens in patchworks across the world and so sometimes you'll see uh fantasy stories or backstory or whatever that's like dwarves or elves gift civilization to humans or whatever i kind of like personally i kind of like the idea that everybody gets it from halflings <laughs> Mm-hmm. You know, like the creature comforts of home and hearth and, and, you know, a community, uh, that's a, I, I don't know, just kind of like that. They're small, they get out of the way, you know, they're, they're not going to attract the attention that, uh, yeah. you know, big strapping I mean, humans will. <laughs> yeah. You can, you can have a lot of halflings in like a hidden away Valley, untouched by, you know, the monsters around them, uh, you know, yeah. protected by a vast mountain range or something. And they have a very, you know forward-thinking society that then some barbarian-like <laughs> humans stumble upon <laughs> and these halflings are what sitting here smoking on? pipes with chimneys and <laughs> drinking out of mugs and stuff it's like oh well it's the uncouth yeah. humans after, again after they're repelled by their well-trained and well-fed militia <laughs> yeah. you know that have time to train together and discipline and have enough caloric intake to beat back these uh mm-hmm. wandering nomads yeah um yeah. I, I like taking this to its extreme conclusion and like what's the epitome of a civilized humanoid sort of worldview that that literally because becomes dominant there are no blank spaces on the map anymore there there's no places where it's like here be monsters like no we know where the monsters are we've studied mm-hmm. them we learn them we we take advantage of them as, as way we can like to me i've start off with something that looks like the flintstones but with D&D monsters and in any place that you could have a piece of technology or of magic or something like that, if a monster would fit in, then, mm-hmm. then you just replace it, you know? And that's the kind of, uh, that's the kind of weird imbalance that I think makes for a good campaign world, you know? Cause it's like, yeah, this, the, the there are really no wild places. There's no place beyond civilization to go adventure, you know, this is a world that has everything figured out. They've cataloged it all. They've they've put it in their their proper uh, place in the the great hierarchy of being, and mm-hmm. you can go see it on Mondays when it's on display. <laughs> you know, yeah. at the uh, the local uh, you know museum or Nickelodeon or whatever. You know, and um, mm-hmm. then you've got to be an adventurer in that setting. It's like what what can you what conflict can you help resolve? What tension is there that you can use to drive play? And it's just evocative and interesting. Um, it could also be like that monsters are used like, you know, animals in our own world have in which they're all of them is processed in some capacity, right? Like you got to go abolith hunting for, uh, you know, for their blubber or their brain jelly or something mm-hmm. like that, you know? And, Again, those are those are sort of worldviews and, and settings that I find interesting because they are so extreme. And you know, maybe in that case you're playing characters that are sympathetic to the plight of these monsters, or you see that civilization having reached its apex is like kind of terrible. Uh, and and now you're having to do something to undo that or, or solve that mm-hmm. tension or whatever. Um, gosh, that's just the one. What about the opposite? What about a world where monsters are dominant? Well, I mean, a world where monsters are dominant. I mean, it's 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 easy to think about like the intelligent monsters being on top. Like, what would it be like if the dragons were ruling everything? You know, the 
the, <clears throat> the pockets of humanity of humans and elves that pay tribute and fe- swear fealty to certain dragons might live okay. You know, it's sure. but you literally have like a baron or a whatever you want to call the hierarchy of it, a lord, a king, of whatever. That if you piss him off, like he will just burn your house down and eat your family, like by yeah. himself. Yeah, and that's right. your that's your world. Like if if the harvest doesn't come in okay, guess what? Farmer, you lose your plot of land. It gets raised to the ground, and somebody else gets it while the while the the wheat is still smoldering out there in the field. And go, you do better now. Now that yeah. I have, you yeah, know, yeah. <laughs> put nutrients back in with the <laughs> the bones of the former family that lived here. Like it would be a pretty harrowing it's for place. Your own good. As long as you as long as you did well, hey, it'd be great. But it could turn on a dime just like that like that to me that's how yep. like dragons rule and then there's places where dragons don't want that they just they they leave the the humans alone just enough to just fly out and get some food come back you know uh let them roam around right. their territory it, it's humanoid arrogance to think that they're the dominant civilization in that setup they only yeah. think they are this could end yeah. at any moment <laughs> yeah you know <laughs> Um, but, yeah, you let, but let other monsters, think what you want. I mean, I, I, yeah, other monsters, I don't know, man, like, um, what's an off the wall monster? I mean, it could just go back to like Abolus, uh, since you mentioned those sure, earlier, yeah. like in a, a more water, uh, covered campaign world, like there's mm-hmm. just chains of like islands where, where all the humanoids, that's where they exist. And there's just mm. seas filled with Aboliths that come up and take some prizes below every now and again. Um, right. I mean, right. that's not a fun place to be either. It's not a fun place. And I feel like the oceans are very underdeveloped in most campaign settings. I like thinking of just like the classic D and D world of points of light setting. There's these little dots of civilization that, that exists relatively in isolation from each other and have to be self-sufficient as much as possible. And they protect a sort of small region around them. Uh, usually they're, uh, their their bread basket, you know, mm-hmm. uh, and then in between those places, it's wild. It yeah. might even be otherworldly, right? It might not even be of the same metaphysical substance as the rest of this place. You literally pass into the wild through some yeah. barrier or boundary, you know, uh, planar influence, that kind of thing. And there's monsters there. There's a lot of them, and they do feast on you. Like it's a precarious situation of where. The monsters aren't so great that they can wipe everybody out, but the but you know civilization isn't so great that it can really expand that quickly, and mm-hmm. and it's a very slow process that could go either way, and that's ripe for adventure. That's like you could do all yeah. kinds of things with that, which is why it's sort of the default, you know. In the land between two rivers, monsters do rule. That's sort of what makes the land between two rivers the part of the setting. It's the one place that anybody knows of where that's not the case. Yeah. And outside of it, in the hinterlands and the wasteland, like if you live somewhere settled, then you probably there's probably a very powerful uh, wizard or something, you know, caster or a monster nearby that you pay tribute to. And for some cases, it's like once in once in their life, a dragon comes by and extracts tribute. But that's happened as far back as anyone can remember and for some reason we live in peace and have everything we need you know we just have to do these certain things at certain times of the year and it's like well these dragons live forever they can literally cultivate humanoids on a generational scale to get sort of exactly who they want for whatever reason you know Mm -hmm. or they're fed upon and this is just the the you know creature's way of keeping them in their pens you know yeah. It's like terrible out there. Uh, and so thinking in terms of like these D and D monsters and what they need from humanoids and what if they didn't have to skulk around in the dark to get it? I think it's a really great question. I know we took a little longer than the usual, but I, I, man, that's a, whew, that's I might a have to do some one. full episodes on that one. That's a beefy I mean, we, one. Jim, we just did. <laughs>